focus on your breathing. It's a simple exercise. Just be with the sensation of the breath all the way in, all the way out. Notice where you have a sense of the breath, which parts of the body have the energy movement or the physical movement. It lets you know that now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And it may be in unexpected places. Just try to be sensitive to what you've got right here, right now. If the mind wanders off, bring it back. Wanders off again, bring it back again. It's a simple exercise, but it's not easy. It takes concentration. It takes mindfulness. It requires alertness. All of which are qualities we have to develop. And everybody goes through the the process of finding that you focus on the breath, and all of a sudden you're someplace else. As if someone had come up with a big sack and had put it over your head and dragged you off, and then dumped you out of the sack someplace else. You wonder how you got there. Well, you have to find your way back to the breath. Unfortunately, it's right here. You don't have to retrace all the steps. Just come right back to the breath. And then you find yourself getting kidnapped again. And it's important that you not let yourself get discouraged. Realize that this is a stage that everybody has to go through. Sometimes you hear people complain that I can't meditate because my mind is too distracted. It's like saying I can't go to the doctor because I'm too sick. No matter how sick you are, you've got to go to the doctor because that's how you overcome your sickness. And the same way with the distraction. You overcome distraction by noticing it every time it happens and bringing the mind back. And try to be quicker the next time in noticing when you're distracted. See if you can sense the, the warning signals, the hints in the mind that let you know the mind is about to go someplace. And then try to be very, very alert. And the powers of mindfulness and the powers of alertness are things that will develop over time. It's like going down to the gym. You can't expect to lift the heaviest weights right from the very beginning or do the most strenuous exercises. You work up to them. This is how you work up to concentration. You bring the mind as long as you can to the breath. And the next time you bring it as long as you can then. Just keep doing your best. And your best will get better and better. So be very clear about what's happening. And at the same time develop the proper attitude. Realizing this is a problem that everybody goes through. This doesn't mean that you're a bad meditator. It's just one of the stages that we all have to go through. This is the pattern that the Buddha himself followed on the night of his awakening. If you ever read about his awakening, there were three knowledges that he developed before he attained nirvana. One was knowledge of his past lives, just thinking back aeons and aeons. This is, that was where he lived, but this is his name, this was his appearance. It's interesting what the, the text focus on, his name, his appearance, the food he ate, his pleasure and pain that he experienced in that lifetime, and then how he died and moved on to the next one. That's life, pretty much. Name, appearance, food, pleasure and pain, death, birth again. Name, appearance, food, pleasure and pain. But principally was knowledge about his own personal narrative how he had come to where he was right then. But then he didn't stop with his own story. The next question was, does this apply to everybody? And the next knowledge, the second knowledge that he gained between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. was the realization that all beings die and are reborn. 
And they have the further realization that they die and are reborn. And the, the nature of the rebirth is dependent on their past actions. The unskillful and skillful actions that they did determine whether they were going to be miserable or happy, or at least set up the conditions for being miserable or happy. But he moved from his own personal narrative to a more universal view, realizing it wasn't just him. Everybody went through the same process. We had that chat just now. I'm subject to aging, illness, and death, subject to separation from the order of my actions. And the actual sutta, the contemplation, doesn't stop there. It requires, recommends that you also reflect that all living beings are the owners of their actions. All living beings are subject to aging, illness, and death. It gets things in perspective. And that's what the Buddha did in his second knowledge. He got things in a larger perspective. But that didn't constitute awakening either. After all, memory of past lives, visions of the universe, beings are dying and being reborn. That's not proof that these things actually happen. The Buddha wanted to know how to test the proof of it. So he focused on that principle. And the second knowledge, the principle of action. Because what was action? Action primarily is intention. It's a mental factor. He realized that your actions are determined by how you view things. So how about just looking at action in and of itself, intention in and of itself? Where do you look? Well, you look in the present moment. This is what brought him to the present moment. To focus on what was happening in his mind right then and there. In particular, how his actions led to suffering and how other actions might lead to the end of suffering. That's how he framed his approach to the present moment, by looking in terms of cause and result, skillful and unskillful. And it's that way of framing the issue that led to his awakening. It's important to reflect on this, because we go through the same process as well. We start with our own personal narrative. We try to get into the present moment, and if your narrative is messy, one thing to do is start cleaning up your narrative. In other words, if you try to get the mind to be quiet and you start thinking about all the ways in which you were stingy or harmful to other people, it's hard to settle down. This is why meditation is part of a larger training, training in being generous and being virtuous, abstaining from things that are harmful and helping people in ways, whatever ways you can. That brings a good narrative to the, the meditation cushion. But before you get into the present moment, the Buddha recommends that you start thinking in a more universal view, because otherwise there's that problem. Like I mentioned just now, you sit there and you think, gosh, I'm a miserable meditator, I can't do this. But then you realize everybody goes through this stage, it's a lot easier to go through it. There's less of the personal recrimination and more of a balanced, equanimous, objective view. And not just that, it's that particular, what are the questions that you're bringing into the present moment? It depends on what your larger view is. Often we hear that mindfulness is enough, you know, like the Beatles old song, all you need is love, and the refrain in a lot of Buddhist circles is all you need is mindfulness. But why? What's good about mindfulness? What is mindfulness? How does it function? You've got to have a view about these things. This is why when the Buddha was giving a talk one time, he said the most important internal quality and the practice. He didn't say mindfulness. He said something called appropriate attention something we hardly ever hear of in Dharma talks. What it means is how you frame the issue, how you frame the way you approach the present moment, how you look at things, the questions you ask. And attention, this is a technical meaning for attention, how you attend to things, how you look at them, how you frame the issues, can either be appropriate in terms of putting an end to suffering or inappropriate. It doesn't, it's not effective at all, it actually creates more suffering. And the appropriate way is to look at just that issue that the Buddha brought to the present moment. 
getting a sense of your intentions and seeing where they're skillful and where they're not. Now, intentions can be pretty slippery things. This is why we start the meditation with a specific intention, very consciously saying, I'm going to stay here with the breath. It's only when you set up an intention like that and try to maintain it, you start seeing other undercurrents of intention in the mind. The intention that wants to think about issues from the day, saying, here we have a whole hour of free time. Let's think about family issues or let's think about work issues. Well, you might not notice that intention. If you hadn't had this prior intention, you're going to stay with the breath. So for the time being, the skillful intention you want to maintain is the one that stays with the breath, that makes the breath comfortable. This is an important aspect. If the breath is uncomfortable, you're not going to want to stay. You have the intention, but it doesn't have any friends. And it's facing what they call the armies of Mara. So you need allies. So one way of creating an ally is to make the breath your friend. See what kind of breathing feels good in the body right now. Long breathing, short breathing, heavy breathing, slow breathing, light breathing, fast breathing. Whatever rhythm or texture of the breath feels right. You can experiment to see. This makes it more interesting. And right there you've got a lesson in skillful and unskillful intentions. Some intentions to change the breath end up in uncomfortable, tight, restricted, or tense breathing. You don't want that, so you drop them. Other intentions create a greater sense of ease. And you realize that your intentions, the, when they talk about karma, that's what, how karma is defined as intention. It's not the case that it shows its results only in the next lifetime. A lot of times your intentions show the results right now. That's an important lesson. And because the breath is so sensitive to the mind, it's a good way to test this principle. So as a John Lee used to say, when you meditate you want the right intention, the right object, and the right quality. In other words, here the right object is the breath, because it is so sensitive to the mind. It's where the mind and the body meet, makes it an ideal object to focus on. Then the right intention is the one to stay there with the breath. And then the third factor is the right quality, the, the quality of the breathing that feels good, the quality of the mind that's willing to be friendly with the breath, explore the breath, learn about the breath. That's willing to test things and then observe the results. When my teacher, John Furong, taught meditation, those are the two words he liked to use a lot, test things he would say, and then be observant. And at first you wouldn't be too confident in what you're observing, but over time you begin to develop a sense. Oh, this little hint shows that the mind is about ready to go. This is how I can recognize breathing that's good for the body. This is how I can recognize breathing that's good for the mind. This is how I can recognize breathing that's good for neither. You learn to interpret the clues. And at first you might be hesitant and your conclusions have to be tentative. But remember, we're working on a skill here. It takes time to develop a skill, but these are the qualities you need. You want to have the desire to work on the skill. You want to be persistent, stick with it. And be intent on what you're doing. Be really observant. And then finally, use your intelligence to ask questions. Bring that property of appropriate attention to what you're doing. When things don't work, use your imagination, use your ingenuity to figure out other ways of making them work. You can't expect all the instructions to come in the book. It's like learning any skill. In the beginning, you start with the instructions that come in the book or what the teacher says. And John Lee's example is of weaving a basket. You weave a basket as the teacher tells you to, and then you look at it, and it looks pretty crummy. But instead of giving up, you say, well, let's weave another basket. 
try to learn from our mistakes with the first one. Why was the weaving uneven? Does the basket look too short, too fat? Does it look crooked? What can you do to make it better? This is where instead of learning from the teacher, you start learning from the, the straw or whatever it is you use to weave the basket. You start learning from your baskets. You learn from your efforts. You learn from your mistakes. The people who intend to engage in a lot of self-recrimination find this hard. This is why it's good to think about that universal principle. Everybody has to go through this stage. And it's an important stage because you refine your discernment as you do this. Discernment is the quality that's going to purify the mind, that's going to lead you to awakening. You can't sit here and simply hope for awakening to come out of the sky and whap you across the head. It comes from refining your discernment so you see what's going on. You see where intentions are skillful, you see where intentions are unskillful, and you see what lies beyond intention. Because it's in your freedom to make choices right here in the present moment. That's the spot where freedom should be investigated. This potential for freedom is going to be found right around here. So this is why the Buddha has you focus on issues of your actions, your intentions, and their results. The really liberating potential of your awareness lies right around there. So this is where you want to look. This is why appropriate attention is the most crucial factor in the practice. The approach that looks at all of this as a skill that you're working on in the hopes of becoming more and more skillful in how you act, more and more skillful in how you evaluate the results of your actions, and then learn from your mistakes. So when you bring this quality of appropriate attention to the present moment, you're setting your practice on the proper footing. And then in that context, with then you develop mindfulness. In other words, you try to keep the breath in mind. You try to keep this perspective, the perspective of trying to be skillful in mind. And then you can be alert to what's actually happening interpreting it within that framework of what's skillful, what's not skillful here. The framework of that larger view, which you don't get tied up in how you're a miserable meditator, this is never going to work. Just drop that. Everybody goes to the stage of being a miserable meditator. The good meditators are the ones who don't stop there. They learn from their mistakes. So keep that perspective in mind. That's how the skill of meditation can begin to show its stuff, what it really can do for you. Every time you sit down to meditate, always try to keep that framework in mind, that perspective in mind, because that's what makes progress possible. That's what focuses you in the present moment in the proper way. We always hear that meditation means being in the present moment. It doesn't mean just being there. You've got to know what to look for, what questions to ask, and that's where the faculty of appropriate attention points you in the right direction.